Well, welcome everyone. This is the annual meeting of the US Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford University. And it's a pleasure to welcome representatives from our member companies and also our friends from the public. We're delighted that you can all uh, spend some time with us to talk about what we're doing this year and also find out more about what you're interested in. I'm going to start by uh, giving an overview of what's been happening with the US Asia Technology Management Center this year. And the first you will see is that from fall 2021, students are going to start coming back to campus, which will be a very good sign. Um, our agenda for today, I'll take 15 minutes for this. Then we've got a panel discussion coming up that I'm excited about. Uh, and Dr. Kushida will talk about his research and program cooperation with us. Then we've got um, visiting scholar and activities reports. And finally, for those of you who can stay around after the scheduled end of the program, we'll turn the recording off and we'll keep talking and uh, doing in network for a few more minutes. So a big change in our history was that we became a membership-based industry affiliates program from 2017. We were approved to be a membership-based industry affiliates program from 2017, which means that our member companies are the primary source of our funds, including for all of our salaries and including for all of the programs that we're putting on. At this time, we also moved from the engineering school over to the Center for East Asian Studies, which is under the Stanford Global Studies program. We are looking at innovation, entrepreneurship, technology trends in Japan and Asia. We do forecasting of the impact of technology change on industry structure. And we also look at innovation management problems, especially open innovation between big companies and startup companies in different cultures. So we've had a very good few years as an industry affiliates program. There's been a steady increase in the number of our member companies with an especially large jump between 2019 and 2020. In this process, we're very proud that we have an extremely low dropout rate. Almost all of the companies leaving are either individual scholars from universities whose universities are not gonna continue after they come back, uh, or successful entrepreneurs who spend a year with us really looking at the next stage in their career. So right now we actually fall into the mid range in terms of size of affiliate programs at Stanford. This is both in terms of the number of member companies and also in terms of our revenues. Speaking of member companies, we have 24 at present, and this is a list. And I certainly want to say thank you to all of our member companies for your support over the year and for the active relationships that we have with you. So 2021 was the year of COVID. All classes and university activities went online from last March, so more than a year and two months now. Stanford closed to all visitors, and everyone who worked at Stanford started working and going to class from home. Uh, I think I've been to my office maybe three times over the last year. Uh, the visiting scholar program was shut down by the university. This had a major, you know, effect on us, although we were able to get extensions for the visiting scholars we already had in place who were already in the Stanford area. We uh, accordingly instituted a research cooperation program to work with member company partners doing research just like visiting scholars would do uh, and they will become visiting scholars when the ban is lifted. We uh, nevertheless, despite challenges, have delivered one of the most active years we've ever had. Um, I'll go through some of these public programs 
and our research efforts and also some new things we're doing for, for members. So one of our flagship programs that we've been doing ever since 1992 are our autumn seminars. We do a different topic every year. This year, we focused on digital transformation among traditional and new company industries in Asia. So the overview presentation came from me and the keynote came from Thomas Siebel, who is the CEO and founder of C3 AI and who's just written a book on digital transformation. But otherwise we had presentations from a number of different Asian countries, China, India, Vietnam, South Korea, uh, and Japan during this series. We had over 500 people who registered for the series. Now they didn't all every week, but it was a very good turnout. For those of you who are interested, we have the videos and speaker slides available on our website. We also gave a new course this past year on rebalancing economic systems. This was co-developed and team taught by Dr. Amit Kapoor and myself. Um, this course really is about developing a new model and metrics for economic management that take into account factors such as inclusiveness and sustainability, as well as economic growth. It's one of the most exciting things I've been able to do in recent years. We put together an extensive reading list, almost all of which was brand new works. We had a number of case study discussions applying the model to corporate decision making. And like all courses now, people are logging in from all over. Uh, we plan to repeat this course to kind of refocus it as an executive short course in September this year. So please be on the lookout for that. The spring seminars that we are just about to finish up right now are on entrepreneurship in Asian high-tech industries every year. We try to give the most recent information about what's happening this year in the different entrepreneurship ecosystems in Asia. So I'm very happy we've had uh, presentations from the Philippines, from China, from Japan, from Taiwan, from South Korea, from India, from Thailand, all in this series. Oh, I forgot Japan. Uh, I was extremely impressed with the talk by uh, Ms. Ishiguro, who is the co-founder and CEO of NetYear Group, which is now a public company in Japan. She was very candid talking about her decision to accept a takeover bid by NTT Data just a year and a half ago. So this has been an exciting series. We uh, give support to a number of other Stanford programs. I've spoken for other classes at Stanford. We um, have assisted other programs like this China Technology Forum to uh, get their speakers and also publicize their efforts. And I'm doing advising, faculty advising for master's student theses and also undergraduate research in the Center for East Asian Studies. Um, we also partner with a number of external organizations, ones that we did this past year. The biggest probably was the Japan US Innovation Awards in terms of how much time it took. Uh, I'm the chair of the steering committee for the awards program. We did it in two sessions last summer, and we have two sessions coming up this summer. Our emerging leader winners were Spiber from Japan and Beyond Meat last year. We haven't announced the US, the, the winners this year. We're about to, probably later this week or next week. We also work with Keizai Silicon Valley to host their programs on Zoom and um, I also serve as the master of ceremonies for their New Year's reception, reception every year that usually has about 250 or 300 people at it. And we also partner with Silicon Valley Future Academy to put on the US Asia CEO Forum. We've done that for the second time um, just last week. And we had over 70 C-level executives who accepted invitations to participate. 
and talked about globalization and innovation strategies in a very uncertain world. You can see that I give a lot of presentations all over the place, Silicon Valley, Canada, Tokyo, uh, Bologna, Italy, Kyoto, uh, and again in Silicon Valley. This keeps us in the news. We want to be the go-to place in regard to Asia innovation and US-Asia uh, innovation relationships. And so this is an important part of keeping people seeing the flag. We um, have some new benefits for our member companies. The biggest one in terms of work for us is that we now put on a monthly meeting for our member companies. Uh, I speak at some of these, but we also get uh, colleagues from Stanford to speak at some of the programs and also from the outside on occasion. These are targeted to topics that we know are of interest to a number of our member companies. We uh, also continue our, our uh, kind of benefits that we've always done, research cooperation. Um, we are supporting three research assistant, graduate research assistants from individual companies right now. And uh, we also are engaged in a special interest group supported by several of our member companies to do research into flexible manufacturing, which supports another graduate student at Stanford. Um, we're, as I said, engaged with companies in research cooperation in exchange for the visiting scholar program, where we treat the person exactly as if they were a visiting scholar, but of course they do not have formal personnel affiliation with Stanford. We're doing everything by Zoom anyway. I've given four seminars at member companies over, since May last year, which we do on request, topics about human resource impact of artificial intelligence and other kinds of things, design thinking that are of particular company. We're including all of our community and the monthly group meetings that are organized by Dr. Kushida and And we continue to share information and insight by email and to give recognition to our visiting scholars at our public programs. So what's going to happen over the next year is that we're going to continue our major programs. The autumn seminars this year will be about mobility and we will again come up with the newest trends in Asian entrepreneurship ecosystems in the spring. And we'll continue our partnerships for the major programs that we're doing. We are seeing really the hot buttons are digital transformation, open innovation and related management trends. And also the kind of growth of a new topolo network topology among US Asia business where we're looking a lot at relationships between different Asian countries, as well as relationships between the US and one single Asian. This is Dr. Kushida. Um, he and Dr. Dasher uh, work together. Um, Dr. Kushida is a research associate. Research scholar. Research scholar uh, with APARC, uh, also at Stanford, and then he has been doing a lot of work with the US Asia Technology Management Center um, over the past year, and we're thrilled to continue that relationship. So he'll talk a little bit more about what he's been doing and I guess the future vision. <laughs> so please, the floor is yours. There we go. Yeah, it's been an exciting year to collaborate more closely uh, with the uh, US Asia Technology Management Center. And so here's just a quick summary of a few of the activities that we've uh, been undertaking. And Kimberly, please jump in and uh, tell me if uh, Richard's back and we can transition back to him. So I'll just run through some of these. One of the highlights that Richard was just saying was our Benkyokai study sessions involving some of the uh, 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 industrial affiliate members. And so uh, here are some of the topics. Harnessing Silicon Valley, 
uh, and then part one, part two, uh, because as I'm going to get to, uh, I'm finishing up a book about uh, the Silicon Valley ecosystem and the emerging J Japanese startup ecosystem. But in order to analyze the Japanese startup ecosystem, we have to have a very, very solid understanding of the Silicon Valley uh, ecosystem. And uh, so we've done things like that, meetups over digital transformation. This was one of the uh, uh, high uh, sort of focus points of uh, USATMC overall. Part three of harnessing Silicon Valley, uh, post pandemic future vision workshops. Uh, what are some of the pain points? What are some solutions? And since over the summer, there was quite a bit of turmoil in the US. And as we neared elections, uh, for a lot of the uh, member companies, understanding the US and the underlying dynamics. I'm originally a political scientist by training, and so I uh, was able to introduce some of the frameworks uh, plugging into the uh, chaos that was happening to provide a bit of hopefully clarity. Others of Silicon Valley way of value creation, digital transformation and ambidextrous management. And I looked into the case of Tesla a bit more, underlying dynamics of the US part two, the current situation of the United States towards a Biden administration. And there was a new year's get together because there was a fair amount of uh, uncertainty in uh, some areas and some certainty about which direction the country was not gonna go in once the election happened. But then there was the riot and these kinds of things. And then the, uh, a little more about the Silicon Valley way of digital transformation. Uh, we did a deep dive in the case of uh, Netflix uh, with our friend and collaborator, Aiko Chikaba. Uh, and then a little bit more about the Silicon Valley way of product management. Uh, we went through a few different cases and this was uh, uh, helped and it featured, highlighted one of the uh, research uh, thrusts of uh, a visitor uh, from uh, NTT Comware, uh, Mr. Shuhei Fukutomi. And then we also looked at uh, human resource development, some of the interesting things that Mitsubishi Corporation is doing, uh, collaborating with the design school and others. Another big one, intercultural understanding and harnessing multiple cultures, because there are many aspects of Silicon Valley uh, culture that are at the cement, um, pretty much the opposite of large firm Japanese corporate culture. So trying to figure out what some of the differences are and find uh, ways to collaborate and remove some of the reasons that collaborations don't work. Uh, and this is part of my academic thrust, uh, aging Japan as uh, opportunity. So looking at how Japan's extreme demographic changes actually have uh, shaped some technological trajectories and provided quite a few business opportunities. And so often demographic change in Japan is seen as a gloom and doom subject, but actually there's a lot uh, to look into. And this comes from my academic study that I did and then spun into a uh, business interest area. So we did one of those. And then this is uh, a little bit before the, this current academic year, but as things were shutting down and this was too good a picture to uh, not include, we looked at Silicon Valley China relations uh, with some uh, people who are very, uh, uh, well-versed in what was happening with China right before the shutdown and during the shutdown and, and a pain point workshop, getting a real user perspective, uh, practicing that not quite the school uh, style, but um, the step first couple steps of design thinking. So looking at the pain points as things shut down, what are some of the pain points and then looking for solutions. Uh, and some of the public outreach talks and keynotes uh, uh, just like Richard, I've been all over the place from my office. Uh, so I did a few keynotes uh, in Japan and other places, uh, and mostly centering around the Silicon Valley style of value creation, organizational transformations, fundamental dynamics of what's being called DX, which is digital transformation. But what are we really talking about? Uh, so those kinds of themes did some uh, in, in different talks like that, several here and there. Uh, another one, and this was more academic, but uh, there was a academic uh, press book published about the Abe government and Abenomics reforms. And my chapter in this edited volume looked at Abenomics and Japan's entrepreneurship and innovation. There was a long list of 200 some key performance indicators in prime, former prime ministers Abe's third arrow of Abenomics. And I was assessing how well they were either accelerating, hindering, or not really mattering for the development of Japan's startup ecosystem. And I came away quite positive, surprisingly, uh, from this. And another couple of things where we, uh, uh, as the transition was about to happen to the Biden administration uh, in Washington, DC, there were all these talks about how to uh, uh, restart the relationship in new ways that hadn't been done. And one was a Mansfield Foundation roundtable discussion on uh, US-Japan alignment on technology policy. 
Uh, and this is where I injected a Silicon Valley and a Japan perspective into the uh, usual DC debates, which uh, I think was useful for that. There was one cor course offering that I did uh, this year uh, for the second year, and it's a, it was listed under uh, international um, policy studies, but it was technology policy, innovation, and startup ecosystems, Silicon Valley, Japan, and comparative perspectives. Uh, way too long to be catchy, but very precise about what I was talking about and what we uh, covered in this course. Uh, other things, media, publications, uh, some interview series that we uh, did with our uh, one of our uh, member firms, uh, uh, Ishing Tech Blitz. They have a nice uh, web media presence in Japan. Uh, and since you were unable to do a large summit, of course, in person this year, one of the things that we did together was I interviewed several uh, uh, corporate entities that were trying to make it in Japan, uh, others that made into Japan successfully, and others that were Japanese entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. So uh, Asana is a uh, uh, quite a successful um, business process uh, tool uh, firm that's now a couple thousand employees, and it has a Japan branch. And we heard from, uh, I interviewed some of the uh, key people who set up the branch and then were growing it, uh, how a Silicon Valley based business tools company can actually find traction among large Japanese companies. And uh, the COVID-19 disastrous opportunity, open innovation. So this is a, a, a VC firm with a lot of, Jap in Silicon Valley and Japan with a lot of uh, limited partners, investors who are large Japanese companies, talk to some of them. Uh, and uh, a notable Japanese entrepreneur who founded his company here at age 25 and he grew the company to the point that it got acquired by ARM, which was then part of, at that point, part of SoftBank for about 66 billion yen within a few years. And so this kind of success story was worth uh, putting in the media and highlighting. So uh, this is the kind of thing. And then others, a column series on understanding the US. This was mainly for a Japanese audience in Japanese. So, uh, and then this is a book manuscript I just finished. It takes a while before academic press hits the uh, shelves or uh, the publication process. So it'll be a while before the actual book is out, but I can talk about the main argument and we'll see over the next year some pieces of this because I'd like to focus on it. We pretty much had, uh, so the manuscript, the book manuscript is a political economy look at Japan's maturing startup ecosystem and how dual logics are emerging in Japan. Pretty much the argument is that there was a traditional Japanese model in which these various components were complementary. The underlying institutions for the Japanese model work together. And uh, they were pretty much antithetical to the emergence of a startup ecosystem because the finance, employment, industrial organization, uh, government, business, university coordination, these core institutions were at very, very different values than, at, uh, than the way Silicon Valley developed. But in parallel to traditional Japan, which is still alive and well, uh, Japan's startup ecosystem emerged with a different set of institutions and very similar, well, the same ones that are here, but at a smaller scale growing, venture capital, flexible employment, startup symbiosis, and uh, uh, more legitimacy conferred by the government and university industry collaboration. And this didn't replace the traditional model. The core argument here is that it coexisted, it emerged uh, as, a, as a multiple multiple logic structure. So it coexisted, but was it fed off of one another, but it wasn't a, a full-scale transformation, which makes it quite confusing then if you look in Japan and look for things that haven't changed, you can find plenty of traditional Japan. If you look at just the cutting edge, new interesting developments in the startup ecosystem, it looks like all sorts of things have changed. So actually both of these things coexist. and. Uh, so the, in, in order to understand this, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, I did a deep dive into uh, scholarship on the Silicon Valley model, then informed by a lot of what we live through by living here. I've been here about 20 years or so and have uh, fairly deep connections, et cetera. So finance, human capital, university industry, government interactions, industrial organization, entrepreneurship, culture, all these are chapters in the book and we'll have study sessions and uh, spin out. So there's a Silicon Valley model. And then in each of these categories, how did Japan's venture capital industry develop? How did its human capital circulation move from dominated by the traditional model to having these pockets of uh, parallel development that then grew and grew? 
So uh, basically, the model is complementary. The Silicon Valley, all these pieces depend on each other. So importing just one piece or another piece doesn't work. Uh, countries around the world have tried this. And it's partly because they're largely dependent on one another. So what Japan experienced was, of course, piecemeal introduction, but it took a while for all of these, each of each one to develop positive feedback loops uh, and, and complementarities. And once the positive feedback loops developed to a certain point, they became more self-reinforcing. So for example, venture capital industry works better if you have lots of good venture capital firms. You get more good venture capital firms if there are more opportunities for them to invest in. So you can see how each of these uh, 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 cycles through and it, took a while, uh, 20 some years, after a series of regulatory changes from the late 90s onward in Japan that took some time to implement and then see the effects from. And shifts in the overall Japanese uh, economic structure uh, helped with things like flexible employment as some of the large firms started to shed employees as foreign finance firms came into Japan and IT firms grew in Japan, leading to more labor flexibility in certain segments. Uh, so. Anyway, that's how the, uh, if we were to look at what Japan's traditional model looked like, what some of the changes look like across all of these um, different institutions, and then tracing each one. That's what this does. So it's a gradual process, but the feedback loops now are real. Uh, the startups in Japan are probably not going to take over the core of Japanese economic activity, and that's fine. They can coexist. They can add more flexibility and provide new opportunities. And large firms learn by working with startups, which then help them engage in open innovation with Silicon Valley because they're more used to the internal processes, et cetera, are more optimized to be able to work with outside entities to add core value. So uh, that's the book. Uh, this coming year, um, I'd like to do a spin-off business press book in Japanese about the Silicon Valley ecosystem. So as you've noticed, some of the things that I do here, I introduce a lot of things about Japan to here with an analytical cut coming from academic sources, and then uh, introduce a lot of things from here, Silicon Valley, to Japan. And so this is exactly where the US Asia Technology Management Center sits in Richard's overall set of activities and what everybody in the affiliates does. So I'm delighted to be able to uh, work together more closely with uh, USATMC and hopefully more uh, in the future. We'll continue the Benkyo Kai this coming year and we're gonna dive further into di digital uh, transformation topics. So uh, that's it from me. So for everybody, I hope you don't mind, we're gonna make a, a minor change to the program and go ahead with our panel discussion now. Since we're starting just after five o'clock, the panel discussion will go for 45 minutes or out to um, 5.45 local time. So I'm extremely happy to be able to introduce two colleagues who I've known for years to talk about uh, applying the, the lessons in Japan and Asia that have been talked about in The Innovator's Dilemma, this famous old book by uh, the late Professor Clayton Christensen. Ms. Michi Kaifu is the CEO of Innotech Consulting, which she has been ever since she was three years old, uh, about 1998. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Innotech Consulting is engaged in looking at business strategies and partnerships between the US and Japan. She's authored two books and a number of articles about te the technology industry. She's also currently a lecturer at Waseda University. And it's always happy to welcome somebody who's an alum back. Uh, Michi is also a Stanford MBA. Uh, our other panelist is Mr. Ken Epstein, and Ken is the principal of New Cap Partners, where he's focusing on M&A and corporate strategic alliances between the U.S. and Asia, especially a lot of work in China lately, uh, in areas that range from chemicals and materials to energy and industrials. He's been an advisor to a number of major firms over the years. And uh, he really came up before he joined or before he founded New Cap Partners uh, doing corporate venturing and new business development for Dow Chemicals in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. So I'm delighted to welcome two colleagues I have utmost respect for. 
if uh, you don't mind, I'd like to ask uh, Michi if you would give your comments first. So uh, thank you, Richard, for your kind introduction. And thank you very much for having me here. Uh, here's the cover of my recent book, which came out uh, last summer, Silicon Valley no Kanemoke, uh, The Making Money in Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, uh, as I say, uh, as he said, I have been working on the partnership between the US uh, and Japan uh, companies. Uh, mainly focusing on the IT. Uh, I uh, originally came from NTT, the telecom background, and I've been working on the IT software uh, and uh, some hardware, uh, including robotics, uh, things like that. Um, and uh, uh, Richard said Waseda, but uh, that's uh, done. And I'm uh, actually uh, teaching at Seike University this fall. Uh, I've been doing the uh, webinars uh, monthly, so uh, you know if you can visit uh, this site, <laughs> you can hear my uh, uh, webinar with my friends uh, monthly. Uh, I've been focusing lately on what's going on in Silicon Valley in the startup ecosystem uh, and uh, uh, you know trying to learn from it. So today's discussion, when we are going to uh, focus on this uh, innovators dilemma uh, discussions, uh, which uh, Richard picked uh, and uh, gave theme for us. Um, as you know, innovators, I, I don't think I have to define innovators dilemma here. Uh, everybody already knows. And uh, it's not limited to just Japanese companies, but there have been plenty of examples of uh, innovators dilemma in Japan. In fact, uh, when I read this book, I thought, oh my God, He's talking about Japanese companies. Uh, and uh, that was, I think the book came about the end of uh, like 1990s, late 1990s. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so that was a time when Japan was, uh, you know, pretty big in mobile technology. And uh, uh, Japan was like really, really bleeding edge, uh, you know, in, in the world. Uh, and in the 90s, uh, in, during the analog era, uh, Japanese mobile handsets had a huge market share in the United States. Uh, there were plenty, a lot of different companies offering the, uh, uh, the phones, like you know, Panasonic, NEC, uh, Fujitsu, and all these uh, other brands. Uh, but in uh, mid 2000s, when iPhone came out, uh, the world had shifted to uh, smartphone, and Japanese companies couldn't catch up to this trend. And I thought that was the typical, very typical case of um, innovators dilemma. All the Japanese mobile manufacturers were doing like really, really hard to uh, brush up their technology. Uh, the left picture is the uh, feature phone uh, in 2006 when Japan was implementing the OneSeg TV. So this mobile phone, you can watch TV as well. Wow, that's great, right? Uh, but uh, the problem was that by that time, the Japanese market was pretty much cut off from the rest of the world. Uh, you know, uh, from transition from analog to digital, there was so much confusion and a lot of Japanese uh, manufacturers, phone manufacturers uh, got out from US market. Uh, and back then the rest of the world was not huge market. Anyway, it's uh, US, Japan and, and some Europe, that was about it. So Japan lost the global market and they were focusing on just Japanese market and that was fine because that was a growing bleeding edge market by, back then. And so they were uh, you know, manufacturing phones just for Japanese market. Uh, and they were brushing up their technology and it was so great. But when iPhone came out, the manufacturers and also the carriers looked at them and it was so disruptive and they thought, oh, you know, who would want to put this piece of you know, plastic thing on your face? Uh, and the battery life is so bad. Uh, and this would um, take away a lot of power from carriers. So, so the carriers didn't like it. Um, so, I mean, there was lots of negativity uh, in the market and they ignored it. Both carriers and the manufacturers ignored it. Um, only I think SoftBank carried uh, iPhone at first. 
uh, then you know what happened. Uh, they lost the market. Uh, the world shifted to the new um, uh, new phase, and uh, uh, they lost it. So uh, the uh, Japanese phone, the, this feature phone, is now called Garake in Japanese. Uh, K is Keita, is the short of Keitai, and Galapagos phone, uh, and Garake, and uh, that's almost like technical term in Japan right now. Compared, so people call non. Uh, uh, non-smartphone uh, garake. So uh, that was, you know, one problem was the, that the Japan lost the global market that was cut off into the domestic market. But the, the second thing was that people didn't see the movement of uh, uh, smartphone. And ultimately the consumers, even the consumers in Japan liked iPhone. So they all shifted to uh, smartphones. So that was one uh, pretty typical case of innovators dilemma. Uh, another thing that is currently happening, and I'm concerning it's not going to happen, is the robotics uh, case. You know, you think that Japan is a robotics, uh, you know, uh, leader in the world, and that is really true for the industrial robots, which is on the left side of the slide. Uh, but it's a relatively, um, you know, stagnant. I wouldn't say stagnant, but it's a cyclical market right now. Uh, you can see that 2019, the uh, demand for the industrial uh, robot has gone down. I'm pretty sure in 2020 it went up, but it's cyclical uh, and it's slow growing, uh, but it's a pretty good market. It's uh, uh, expensive, expensive stuff, high margin stuff. The uh, Fanak Yaskar are one of the big fours in the world. Uh, so. Japan still has a big grip, uh, good grip in it. But uh, the uh, focus on the robotics market right now is the service robot, which is on the right. Uh, and uh, especially the logistics robots, which is used in the warehouse, is the fast growing market right now. Admit it, those are quite different technologies. So you might not consider it as a the same thing. It might be a totally different thing, but if you put it as a robotics or the automation uh, machineries, then the um, the world is going quickly in uh, logistics robots. And Omron, among Japanese companies, is tackling on it. But the biggest player is Amazon right now. And there are a lot of uh, American uh, startups that are uh, uh, working on this, on this world. And uh, you can see that because it's so fast growing, uh, it's the, the whole market is now very getting close to um, the industrial robot market. Um, so um, I hope the uh, things would not, the innovators then wouldn't happen here, uh, but that's, uh, that's a danger right now. So um, I'm not going to go too much in detail here, but you can see why Japan has more problem than US. Uh, in terms of tackling on uh, innovators dilemma. Uh, the, uh, uh, especially uh, US companies have been doing or utilizing the ventures, the startups in tackling on this innovators dilemma situations. They let ventures do the messy work until you know, a lot of uh, competitors fall off in that messy uh, early, uh, early stage, and then they acquire the uh, successful ones later on. Um, so, uh, and, and the, also the US companies have been easier. It has been easier for US companies to hire and fire employees uh, or uh, acquire or getting rid of divisions. Uh, so, and the Japanese companies have not been doing that uh, for, uh, for a long time. So uh, that getting rid of what is not current <laughs> uh, is, is, uh, is, a, uh, is a very important thing. You know, you have to focus, you have a limited resources in the company. So it's, it's okay, it's nice to start a new product or new uh, project, but you have to reallocate your resources and you have to get out of the old ones once uh, you, know, you see the new trend. So that has been a problem for a lot of Japanese companies for a long time. And uh, especially now that you have been he hearing all the uh, discussion about agile, iterations, 
uh, the uh, 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 lean startups, all that concept that you start uh, something small and uh, uh, fail early uh, and then uh, make quick improvement and go to the next stage. That type of process is now the only way to do the new things. Uh, but also with that, you have to uh, have the process to get rid of the old ones. Uh, so that's been the case, uh, the problem for a lot of Japanese companies. So yeah, uh, so that's, uh, that's been the problem, especially now the focus is on that shift to the software-based world. Uh, uh, Shida sensei and Dasha sensei both uh, discussed about the uh, uh, digital transformations in that uh, in that world, uh, Japan can be behind in terms of uh, uh, innovators dilemma again. So yeah, uh, it, again, this is not unique to Japanese companies. Uh, McKinsey says that 70% of all DX projects tend to fail. Uh, including US or European or any other big companies. So it's larger. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's common, uh, but the Japanese companies often are, you know, not feeling the threat directly, just like in case of mobile phones, uh, they didn't feel the threat uh, of smartphone uh, disrupts Disrupt, dis, disruptive power of smartphone because they were confined to their domestic market. In a lot of cases, the uh, uh, when Japanese companies are not directly involved in the global market, that's they're, they're not feeling the the, uh, the threat. Uh, Walmart, for example, in Japan, uh, in the U.S., uh, they had the direct threat by Amazon, so they had to uh, transform themselves. Uh, so uh, they were, they have been making a huge, huge uh, effort uh, in transforming into the digital company. Another uh, of, uh, example that is often referred uh, in the US is Goldman Sachs. Uh, also the uh, financial market is uh, facing a threat by the new, new uh, comers. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, uh, this is from a few years ago, the, uh, U.S. financial companies are trying to hire the uh, IT type, uh, and they tend to have this midtown, what, what is called midtown uniform. Um, so, anyways, um, that's been going on. Uh, so, looking at the examples in Japan, although you know we have been talking about this cultural problems, I think the uh, things have been changing a little bit now. I start to see some companies that are transforming, you know, getting rid of the uh, uh, divisions uh, and transforming into something else. And one example is the Hitachi Group, I think. Uh, in terms of uh, IT, uh, Silicon Valley relationship, I think they are the biggest empl employer of uh, uh, in Silicon Valley among Japanese companies. I think they have the biggest presence in, in, uh, uh, in Silicon Valley. They have acquired a company called Pentaho, the big data visualization company. Uh, and they have launched a new division called Bantara in 2017. And they have been disposing non-essential businesses uh, left and right. They have been really active in doing that. So we, so that is quite interesting, uh, which uh, has not been seen too often back in, uh, back in some old days in Japan. Uh, it's not just Hitachi, a lot of uh, big companies have started to utilize uh, uh, private equity funds uh, and sell the divisions to these funds. Uh, started to see some of my friends get hired as a CEO of that uh, uh, acquired divisions. Uh, so it's it's becoming more uh, all, more common in Japan. So um, it it is happening. Uh, but anyway, so the important part is that the uh, now not just Japan but all the uh, uh, you know cutting edge companies are facing the un certainties in the future. You don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and in those type of situations, the only way to uh, make improvements or make uh, some new steps or, you know, going forward is the iteration. You, know, you start small, uh, try, uh, fix, uh, and throw away the project entirely sometimes if uh, that things doesn't work. And that has to be done from the leadership. Uh, the uh, it's, it's not 
something that comes natural from the culture in Japan. Uh, Hitachi case, uh, I, it, it certainly it was coming from Japan. So, I mean, coming from the top. Uh, and another way of doing it, often the Jap a lot of uh, the uh, uh, partners here uh, trying open innovation in Silicon Valley. And, uh, uh, you know, often I think people are just thinking that, oh, we're gonna invest into uh, venture companies or venture capital. But that's not it. You know, you um, want to uh, probably ultimately acquire some uh, startups and you learn how to iterate with venture partners. Uh, and not just uh, Silicon Valley, you might want to do it in Japan, you know, bring, bring it back and acquire or invest or acquire uh, a startup company is in Japan. That might be the only way to handle chaos. And uh, uh, you have, that is the uh, one good way of doing iteration, not just the uh, doing the uh, things inter internally. Uh, so uh, that's, that's it for my discussions. Uh, we will uh, yeah. do the discussions later. Okay, Michi, those are great comments. Thank you for sharing those. While Ken is getting ready uh, to get started, can I ask you, do you know anything about how Hitachi was able to kind of do the, these things like acquire companies and like and you know kill divisions and so forth. Was it a very strong CEO in the company, or was it something where they more afraid than other companies? What, what do you think <laughs> was motivating them? Yeah, um, that's actually a good question, and I I cannot really answer it directly. Um, I have done some study about why they could do that in Silicon Valley situations, you know, uh, because why do they have that such a big presence in the United States uh, uh, in, in Silicon Valley? And for that one, uh, I have actually interviewed the CEO of Hitachi and, uh, uh, but I couldn't get the straight answer. It was funny. Uh, <laughs> they say, oh, we've been doing it for a long time and it's just a natural progression. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, for the uh, the overall uh, co corporate strategy, I have to do a little bit of research, but I it, it's not something that is talked about often, uh, which is very interesting. So um, you know, uh, please uh, you know keep it as my uh, uh, homework for the next time. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. <laughs> uh, Ken, let me ask you if you give your prepared remarks, and we'll have a few minutes to talk at the end, I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Ken Epstein. Uh, everybody see me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I work with small companies, and they raise capital from large companies, and we get into culture and strategy questions that Michi raised, because the large companies look at it, and they say, well, we may be able to use it, but it's always hard to integrate. And we also sell companies to small, larger companies or represent large companies buying small technologies. So my background is pretty broad. I worked for Dow Chemical for many years and, and lived in four or five, four countries. Uh, worked very heavily with in Japan with a joint venture there um, and uh, have dealt with cultural changes in within Dow and other companies um, as we've gone along with trying to do transactions. So um if you can see this one of the one of the things that we use you know it's anyone who's taken economics has run into a uh what is called creative destruction which Michi is describing is is innovator dilemma is you have to expect that new business new technologies innovations will replace outdated ones and this goes back to a uh, economics 101 uh, joseph schlumpeter gives that as a normal course of action that you have to expect and you just have to prepare for it. Well, that's easier said than done as well, Mitch, you went through with the, some of the examples. And, and what happens is you've got to deal with all these different issues. She talked about culture. This is not a Japanese problem. This is everywhere. And we've done deals in the US and, and, and when you try to put in a new business, the people that are in the company have come up in the old businesses. They don't understand the new business. They don't, they, they don't trust it. And they built their career in the old businesses. It's a tough sell to get them to change. The workforce, as Michi showed, 
trying to get, you have an existing workforce, whether it's in Japan or elsewhere, they're the wrong fit. You have, if you're doing uh, mechanical stuff and you want to put in AI or you want to do electronics, suddenly you have the wrong engineers. And so you have to change the workforce. Not always easy to do and not easy to do on a quick pattern. And they have to have different career paths. You can't bring them as staffers. They have to have a career. So this is another challenge. And then you have profitability. Almost every large company that's been in business more than 10 years has legacy businesses that are running into this competitive problem. And they're struggling with what they do with the legacy businesses. And they have those sometimes represent a large percentage of revenue, but the small percentage of profitability. This is a constant challenge as we go through this. So what I want to do is go through a couple examples uh, and, and show some changes and showing some issues that have to be done. Uh, so I'm going to pick carbon fiber. It's a material. It could be any material, but I've chosen carbon fiber because the Japanese dominate the carbon fiber business. The three big companies that are in the, in the, in the carbon fiber material business, Torre, Tejin, and Mitsubishi Chemical. There are other players, but they're the three biggest. Uh, in the global market. The markets are wind turbine blades. You see all the offshore blades. They're very heavily carbon fiber. If you've flown on a 787 Boeing aircraft, that's 50% carbon fiber. Um, and the future market is, is potentially transportation, cars and light trucks. Okay, three big players. This started, the aircraft business was, the, the wind was going slowly and the aircraft business started in the 2000s. Three companies went after it, Torre, Tejin, Mitsubishi. All of them are raw material suppliers, so they don't want to go downstream to compete with their customers. Their customers were taking the carbon material, making it into, into part uh, composites, and then making it into parts. The challenge was, how do you get to the end user in a new area and make a solution? Torre decided they're going to go downstream. They're going to go into composites. They're going to they're going to run the project as a project manager. They're going to qualify the aircraft component. They're going to make it all. They'll bring in everybody else under them, but it's theirs, their responsibility, their liability. They did it that way. Tajin and Mitsubishi stayed as a raw material supplier, worked with all the channels, all the supply channels. They didn't ever get to understand the final problem. They couldn't solve the crash worthiness and all the other stuff that was non-material, all the stuff that has to go in the system. Torre won the business. They got it 100%. Neither Mitsubishi nor Tejin got on the 787 at all. So you went from no sales in, in carbon fiber for Torre and anybody else to 100% marketplace. And Torre jumped to be the largest supplier. That was a strategy. It was a change in the market. You had to change your company to do this. It's a cultural change to go downstream to challenge your own internal because you're going you're gonna to have compete competition. You have to deal with your clients. Okay, fast forward. Tajin lost 10 years, still a material supplier. Then they said, wait a minute. This is a cultural change. We've got to change our thing. In the mid-2010s, two things were happening at Tajin. One, they started to get into non-material business. They got into some pharmaceutical business, some healthcare business. In 2020, 30% of, of the sales, but 80% of the profits are medical. The other thing they did was, we're not gonna make the same mistake we made on the aircraft. We're gonna go and get into the potential for auto. We're gonna buy downstream. We're gonna go into the OEM business and they spent $800 million to buy one of the largest automobile OEM composite companies. So here's the cultural change. They had a medical, the top people are now medical people at Tajin. They used to be material people and they now have a big subsidiary in auto. Now they're in systems, total difference. That was a 20 year cultural change, a real challenge within the company. This was not easy to change the medical in 2000. If you looked at Tajin's management, it suddenly changed where top people were coming in from medical to come in and they have they were now diversifying. That's a challenge and it's, it's unusual, it's done. Mitsubishi Chemical, same problem. They had all these little divisions and they didn't coordinate themselves. They were a material supplier and they were into other stuff. After the aircraft, they did, they merged all this stuff. They went to composites, they now make parts. 
They make parts for cars, parts for other things. So they're doing, they're doing a bunch of subsystems and they're doing other stuff to do that. So they have a fully integrated, they're not worried about going downstream and competing with their competition. So that's going on. And then within this case, all the material suppliers in, in Japan, several of them are going into medical areas. So Tajin's not the only one. JSR is a rubber company. Everybody know who they are. They're now pushing and they're trying to be a lead in medical. So you're seeing, you're seeing, in, as Michi said, Hitachi, there are a few other changes. This is taking 10 and 15 years, but it's starting to happen. And it's, it's a culture problem. It's a workforce problem. And you have to buy a division. You've got to get new people in. You can't do it with your own people. And then, and you have to, and then it has, takes time for those people to get up in the organization so you can have a decision to support the new business rather than support the legacy business. But it's happening. And I wanted to give a couple examples where it is ha happening, but this took 15 years. This is not something that happened suddenly. So, you know, just so as an illustration, there, I want to go to a second one, and it's still not resolved how this is going to work out. Let's talk about industri in internal combustion engines versus electric vehicles. All the players we know, there's a number of them in Japan and a number in China and Asia. We're the electric car companies, all new players. Now, some of the existing players are moving into it. VW with a joint venture uh, for batteries. Uh, GM with batteries. Uh, there's some partnership with, Bo um, they're talking about the BMW and GM. I mean, there's a whole bunch of starting to happen. What's the Japanese company is going to do in, in electric vehicles? Not sure where they're playing. Uh, Toyota and Honda are, and, and Hyundai are more on the hydrogen side. Okay, where the perspective is on this one, is it going to be cars? Is it, Can a, a hydrogen car be in Japan, but it may not be global? But the light, uh, the heavier vehicles, that looks like it's going to go hydrogen. There's a big commitment on hydrogen in Europe. There's a big commitment in some in China to go hydrogen for heavy duty for clean for fuels. And we're going to see more. And look at the new players that are coming in: Shell, BP from the oil companies. Toyota's talking about being in the hydrogen business, not just car business, being down in the transportation systems business, integration. Honda is talking about aircraft, portable aircraft with hydrogen, and there's all kinds of truck companies and energy companies. So what is all this? How does this translate? We don't even know the full answer how this is going to be in change. Everybody's now uncertain what's going to happen in the industry. And boy, is this affecting workforce. You don't need high trained people to do electric vehicles, transmissions and all internal combustion parts are not needed. You're going from thousands of parts to hundreds of parts. The whole supply chain is getting ripped apart and it will eventually go away. You less, less people are needed on an assembly. Uh, you need different skilled people, more software sensor, the sensors, and you need people who know batteries or hydrogen, depending on which electric vehicle. Capital investments, as Mishi said, software, software and more software. And that's not where Japan has been in the, in, in the, in the past and in a lot of other, and, and it's not where it's been in the European cars. If you look at the biggest problem with luxury cars, Mercedes, BMW, and Audi over history, is their electrical problems. Electrical problems and information systems, they're great on performance, but they're not much better on the AI and software side than the Japanese cars. So it's not a problem just for Japanese cars. It's a problem internally in, 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 the, in the car company industries. That's a major change. And these sensors coming in for safety are already forcing it. Change in workforce. You're going to change people. So you have to get all new people and new business models. This is where all these changes are going to cause cultural problems. Mercedes has an Office 365 type license that they're, they're trying out where the car owners sign up for so many days a month. They use more, they pay more, and they can pick up the car and drop it off anywhere in Germany. It's not widely spread, but they're, they're playing with it. Another player, another in China, they're looking at maybe not even the cars not have the batteries are separate. You get in and you lease the battery, you just buy a basic car to keep the cost of the car down. India is looking at the same thing because of cost of the car. And then, like I said earlier, Toyota wants to go down in the channel and maybe in the energy business. 
in hydrogen because it'll be complementary to what they're doing. So to be determined, I don't want to say I have the answers and this is all going to be changes that are going to affect Japan and other company, other countries in this whole infrastructure. And then what it's going to affect is a lot of less jobs, fewer models, more internet sales, more you know, less dealership, no, much less facilities needed for service because there's not much needed. So you're going to, but there's going to be a loss of skills. There's a whole bunch of people trained in internal uh, combustion engines do transmissions and there's mechanical skills. They won't be needed. They're not the same people that can translate into AI and computer skills. So it's a challenge. So what I want to, as we talk about this creative destruction, it has its ups and it has its downs and we don't really know where it's going to go in this particular industry, but some people are making the change. And obviously I gave some illustrations in Japan they're going that way. So just wanted to give you some illustrations that, that would complement what Mitchie was talking about. That's me. Ken, those are great. Thank you. Uh, if you will stop sharing your slides, I, I think we can move into a discussion for a few minutes. Um, I got a follow-up question for you. When Tejin uh, bought, you know, spent $800 million to buy downstream, yep. um, a kind of a composite maker, do you have you heard any kind of stories about what sort of problems they may have had with post merger integration? Because the decision makers in Tejin, who's the buying company, were all the old people, right? I mean, the old the old way. Well, actually, the, the decision makers were from the healthcare business. They had already ah. transitioned, so you already had okay. a culture change that the the legacy business people were out. OK, so it, they actually were more open because they were the new people. OK, because I think that's, you know, this kind of issue, who's got the power in the company is one of the keys for a company to being able to change. Absolutely. You've yeah. both given great examples of how this happens. The big company is strong in a market. So of course they want to protect their existing business and the people are very comfortable with that existing business. New things come in that are after uh, small markets or they're after just emerging markets or they are really kind of somehow in markets that the big companies are really not going to take seriously at first. And uh, what happens is that becomes the new way of doing things. And by the time the, the incumbents figure it out, it's too late. Right. So um, I'm really curious what you think uh, are recommendations for how a big company can get over this kind of um, challenge. What, what what do you do? If, if you're going in to advise one of the car makers now, Ken, what would you tell them to do? Well, yeah, this is an issue because, okay, in the U.S. car making business, most of the people who are on the top of the company came from the engine performance area. And this this is not electric cars. I mean, <laughs> electric cars yeah. are, are efficiency, not performance. They're not looking at 500 horsepower engines, right? You know, and so you've got a culture, well, you've Tesla got a cultural problem to sell yeah. this. This is why yeah. there's a lot of resistance. Uh, but even, even to the other fact, they've never dealt with this. This is a risk. This is a whole new thing. And as you said earlier, and Michi said, change is tough. It's a, not an easy sell. And yet you have champions within the company saying, we, we are looking for, we need, we have to do this. And they are selling that they're the entre entrepreneurs, if you want to say the internal, it's a hard sell. It takes a yeah. while to convince them and it takes some outside negative effects. Hopefully it won't go like the phone where you don't have time to respond, but it, in the car industry, it's already apparent. I mean, look at the, there's no barrier to entry to come in with electric cars. There's all these new players. So if you're an existing legacy business, you don't have a choice. You're going to, you're either going to play, do something different. And that's why we don't know what Toyota and Honda are going to do because they have several different ways they want to go. And so is Hyundai and VW is committed. They're going electric, whether it's hydrogen or electric, and they're going by 2030. So they're going to force that culture change. 
that's going to affect okay. all their workforce, right? It's going to affect on the, where the plants are, how many people they're going to hire. It's it's going to happen because they've said they they can't. They're all their alternatives. They're going to not be competitive. Okay. So so, so Michi, can I can, yeah, can I come in? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, it's not specifically for um, automobile uh, industry, yeah. just in general. Um, I think one solution is the diversity. I'm not talking about including women, but having uh, people from diverse background and diverse opinions, uh, which has the effect on the uh, management decisions, you know, not just the employee level, but uh, the management, uh, you know, the top people, board maybe, uh, you want to have the different uh, uh, viewpoints. Uh, and uh, uh, so that if CEO decides to go different directions or have wider perspective of what's going on, uh, you have to have enough strong opinionated people around you. So um, I think that's one thing you can do. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have a question from Ken Ito, who says that, are we trying to say that Japanese companies are not as good in overcoming change in company direction? If so, why do you think that's so? Michi, I think that one's for you first. Yeah, so, so that's the lack of diversity. You know, you, you tend to have yeah. the same uh, similar uh, thinking people uh, at the top, uh, then uh, it's it's very different, difficult to change. And especially for the older Japanese companies, often the uh, former executives even have the say to the direction of the company. And, and that's, that's often uh, pointed out as the bad influence because they are even the older uh, uh, minded people. Uh, so, you know, definitely the solution is to have enough uh, fresh viewpoints. What about the, the workforce, each Michi? The, the big, I see that not uh, another big problem with some of the, and it's not just Japan, but it's in Europe, Europe with the strong labor unions, is you have mm. an existing workforce. And their yeah. skill base are mechanical. You That's go to, a, uh, uh, or, uh, uh, sorry, any place you're going where it's, it's switching to AI and software, you're going from some people who are, they have certain skill levels, they're no longer needed. You need some new people. And if you can't change your workforce, and that's not just Japan, Germany and France with their unions have the same problem. This is an issue on slowness to change, right? Right, exactly. And uh, um, I think that's also refers to what I talked about, which is to the way to dispose of uh, the uh, divisions or the people who have the older skills. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to just cut off people. You know, they have their own families and they uh, have their livelihood and, uh, you know, unions are so, there and stuff like that. So you have to find a way to treat people uh, who so are I, I on the receiving make, side. <laughs> I, I also want to make a comment on this uh, because I think that workforce change is essential but if you go up the, the hierarchy, the people who have to make those decisions, I think they have too much job security. Mm. That this is why you can get by without hearing the diverse voices is sure. because if, the, if they make a mistake, if the company loses revenue, then the CEO may get fired by the sure. board. Yeah. But most of the time, a CEO is not going to have a hard time justifying why they're not developing something new you you know more activist kind of investors and more diversity on the board that would put more pressure at the top of management may be essential in order to uh get the management off their rear ends that's a, yeah i think that's a very good point and especially in japanese culture they like to punish people but not praise uh, or reward yeah. the success. And uh, uh, so if you do something new and if you fail, you get fired or you, you know, you're, yeah, you, that's you the lose. End. But yeah. uh, if you do something new and su succeed, then often cases you may get a small promotion and that's it. So uh, that's another cultural issues. Uh, you may want to, uh, because success is more difficult uh, you know, if you try something new, oftentimes you fail. 
yeah. success is, is few. Uh, so you have to have enough reward to uh, give to these people who tried. And that's the, that's the, uh, that encourages the iteration process that I talked about. But that's a challenge in every big corporation around yeah. the world. It's not a that's Japanese right. problem. I mean, yeah. not only a Japanese problem. That's true. Well, yes. uh, you know, if when we're talking culture, we're talking big company culture. Right. Big company right, culture. Right. Right. Yeah. That's I true. think that that's the real issue. Uh, the Galapagos syndrome, though, is kind <laughs> of an interesting thing that you do see happening a lot in Japan. Because the market can develop relatively in an independent direction. Mm -hmm. Michi, why do you think um, that could happen so much with the old feature phones? And also what Ken is talking about with the possibility of hydrogen cars being mm. kind of, you know, Japan develops its own standard and the rest of the world goes <laughs> somewhere else. Right. That happened with uh, high definition TV for 20 years, too. That's true. That's true. Right. Uh, one, I think one reason is that Japanese market is too big uh, to be totally marginalized, uh, but not big enough. Uh, it's like somewhere in the middle. So if you are comfortable in doing things within Japanese market, then uh, it's, it's tougher to compete in the US or in China or anywhere else uh, than in Japan. So uh, that is one problem. You know, if you are Nokia uh, from, uh, you know, Finland, the domestic market is too small to survive in the, in the global market, uh, you know, global level. But Japanese market often is big enough to sustain <laughs> enough of your business. And I think that's one of the problems. And another thing is that, you know, people want to, uh, you know, become the leader often. They want to create their own standard and try to expand it to globally. Uh, but uh, often it, the decision is made uh, pretty much cut off from the information of the rest of the world. Uh, that might be caused by the language difference. Uh, you know, often I see that people are catching up to the uh, technology information just by Japanese language sources, not referring to the English sources. Um, and uh, if the decision is made according to that small world, then you tend to make mistakes. Thank you, that's great. Ken, one last question, and I'll ask you to go first with it. And this has to do with the role of kind of greater Asia. You know, the supply chains in the auto industry are completely changing around. Uh, and really, you know, recent political kind of tension, as well as shutdown of transportation due to COVID-19, really messed up kind of international supply chain relationships for a while. Uh, how do you think that's going to play out? Ken, that's for you first. All right. Well, we're talking cars and transportation or we're just general? Uh, I would be more general, just okay. wherever you see. Um, well, we're seeing more in the U.S., in, like in the, in the medical, the, all that medical drugs didn't come. We're yeah. seeing more and more pressure to have some of that come back to be made in the U.S. So historically, all your APIs for your drugs were made in India, more than China, right? For yeah. This is for Europe and this is for US. I don't know about Japan as much as India supplies it, but they certainly supply for Europe and the US. And there's a more and more money and needs and hospitals here are saying, we want US API production. We do not want it in India. And we're going to pay for that. And we'll even, we'll even sign multi-year contracts for that. So we're starting to see some people looking at the supply chain and saying, we've got to change it. But I have to go back to fundamentals. We violated the fundamentals of distribution. And this was part of the problem we had. When you put just-in-time delivery in anything, you end up with one supplier somewhere in the world and, something, and you have no backup. Yep. And if you take any logistics course in anything you distribute, whether it's software, hardware, boards, you have a local supply, you have a backup supply, you have maybe a third supply because it's a hurricane, it's a storm, there's a fire. If this is nothing to do with a crisis, this is the norm. And then we went to just in time, save money, and we went away from the, the standard problem, which is not just a China problem, it's a standard problem of not having domestic, and a, a local and a backup. 
anybody who's doing logistics usually sets that up. I mean, that was a that was one that I had to do when I was in company. Every company used to do that. Then they went to just in time. So that's your issue. I mean, that's a that's the big that we're going to see some change in that. We're going to go back to having a backup. Great, Mitchy. Any final comments on that or other topics? Yeah, that's interesting. I think the uh, world will be more distributed. Uh, you know, I, I think distributed is one key terms for the coming 10 years or so. Uh, it, you know, you cannot rely 100% to Taiwan in, you know, uh, semiconductor <laughs> production anymore. Uh, you know, even the hardware has to be distributed and you have to find a way to to have enough lowest low low enough costs for doing that and it's tough but it's becoming necessary uh and uh, uh software based economy in the meantime has to continue i mean it, it will continue uh for some time to come so the uh, whole value uh sort of composition of the products and services uh, will be a little bit different from going on. So um, I don't know how it works out. It's it's really, we are into that early on in iteration process of this new, uh, new world, but uh, it has uh, probably came earlier than we expected because of COVID. So uh, we have to somehow deal with it. <laughs> it's an interesting okay. era. Yeah. Ken, final comments? No, I'm fine. Okay, great. So everybody, thank you very much to our panelists for wonderful presentations and panel discussion. Uh, this was, you know, I learned a lot from these programs. So we will now take a 10 minute break. And uh, at the end of 10 minutes, we will come back and have our visiting scholar presentations. Um, we will go in this kind of order, but instead of starting at 5.55, we will start really closer to six o'clock. Okay, everyone. So we're going to go in reverse alphabetical order and ask each of our uh, visiting scholars to keep a strict seven minute time limit. I'm afraid to say that we don't have time for people to ask questions during the presentations. It's gonna be one after the other. But uh, at the end of the session, uh, after I just say goodbye to everybody, we'll keep the program going for anyone who would like to stay around and have some informal Q&A that will not be recorded. And hopefully all of our visiting scholars can stay for that as well. So uh, first up is Ms. Kyoko Yoshida from Kawasaki Heavy Industries. Kyoko, the floor is yours. I'm Kyoko Yoshida. I work with Kawasaki Heavy Industry. Since last September, I have worked, I have been researching with Dr. Dasher. I would like to introduce about my company and my research today. These are the business area of Kawasaki Heavy Industry. Oh, sorry. Uh, our sales are about uh, $14 billion by year, and the company employed 36,000 people. As you all know, Kawasaki is famous for its motorcycle, but we also provide a variety of products that are found in the slide. For example, we have recently started offering the surgical robots too. These are topics of interest, interest to Kawasaki as we continue to provide customer value with the latest technology in our various business areas. We invest about $400 million a year in R&D on our own. However, with the rise of startup with barrier technology and the global increase in the number of researchers, we are also working on collaboration outside the company. Uh, with startups, university, and research facilities. As you know, it's called open innovation. For example, we are collaborating with two robot software startups in Silicon Valley since Kawasaki manufactured robots. This is my bio. 
I'm in charge of open innovation in Silicon Valley. My mission is to research startup and support to make a collaboration between Kawasaki and startups. In addition to avoid not seeing the wood for the tree, I'm learning about practical approach to open innovation in Silicon Valley at Stanford University. Through this, I'd like to develop digital business in industry area with Kawasaki and a startup uh, in the near future. I'm interested in two things. First, how does large company collaborate with startup? The process of finding them, how to evaluate them, how to partner with them, and the tip and know-how when doing so. Also, collaborating with startup requires an understanding of the ecosystem and the incentive of the player, as shown in the diagram. The second is how does CVC, corporate venture capital, work for large company growth by investing in startup? Until a while ago, uh, I, IT company was the main player in CVC, but now a uh, player in the medical, automobile, and even industrial domain are investing in startup uh, through CVC. I am interested in how they are functioning. I've been doing research on these five outlines until now with Dr. Rusher. Although uh, it is research, it is very useful for my daily work too. By doing both work and research, I have been able to learn the principle and the basics as well as the nuts and bolts of open innovation and Silicon Valley. From, uh, from now, I'm going to continue studying about CVC next. Uh, finally, I would like to introduce about one lesson learned in Silicon Valley. In order to enter the inner circle in the ecosystem, we have to commit the business with startup for the long term. We need to share the vision, risk, hard time, and effort with ecosystem players. Through a business, we have to establish trust, influence, and a good reputation. I found the basic of business are the same all over the world. This concludes this presentation. Thank you for, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yoko san, thank you very much. That was great and very succinct. I appreciate that. Our next presentation is going to be by Mr. Yoshito Terada of Hamamatsu Iwata Shinkin Bank where it's now about 10 in the morning. Terada-san, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. My name is Yoshito Terada, USAID-MC visiting scholar from Hamas Iwata Shinkin Bank. I'm a little bit nervous because I've been staying in Japan from last September. That means I have no chance to speak English. And thank you to Dr. Dasha for holding a meeting every week during a year. I have joined in this U.S. ATMC Corporate Affiliate Program since July 2019, but I returned to Japan due to the influence of COVID-19, and now I've been dispatched to Hamamatsu City Hall temporarily since last October. My research team at Stanford have two points. First, to create local ecosystem in Hamamatsu, and to create an innovative organization based on DX. Let me explain a little about the role of Shinkin Bank. Shinkin Bank have three characteristics, regionality, SME centricity, mutual aid principle. You can imagine like credit union in the US that is said to be similar to Shinkin Bank. Therefore, we are called Home Doctor as a small company. Now, let's talk about the first research results at Stanford. To create local ecosystem in Hamamatsu, this slide shows our company's relationship diagram in Silicon Valley. In order to obtain information from Silicon Valley, we have invested in Sozo VC and DNX VC as a limited partner. Another point, we are able to get daily news 
and US trends from online community as a member of JCCNC and Digital Darkness community. By knowing ecosystem built in Silicon Valley, we are trying to create the homogenous version of the ecosystem by Hughes that is operated our bank. Next, I'd like to talk about investing, investing in startup and the purpose of its investment. Gyoza is world famous nowadays, so we invested startup called Republic which is established in Japan last year. This startup specializes gyoza, pot stickers. The purpose of this investment is to know, to know real startup. We can get know-how the inside of the startup. If we don't know the startup inside, we will not be able to get customer for startup. In addition, Hamamatsu is the number one city of pot stickers in Japan. But as you can see in this slide, we were able to introduce our customer as a supplier of Republic. In this way, we believe we can promote the, the global, globalization of our customers. The fourth implementation is to adapt ISO 56002 into our bank. This ISO 56002 is a new international standard called, called Innovation Management System, which is ruled by ISO. The purpose is to create dynamics for innovation, in, uh, dynamics for innovation to our bank. We aim to create an innovative organization with world standard. However, what is important is the development of DX skills. There is an online education platform called Udemy in San Francisco, and we are planning to adapt into our bank. Next, I'd like to explain a little about applying what I learned at Stanford to assignment at Hamamatsu City Hall. We, Hamamatsu City, are trying to use digital tools for remote medical care and experimental use of drones for drug delivery to depopulated areas. Finally, I'd like to review lessons learned. First, due to the influence of the corona pandemic, our sales method must change from traditional in-person ways to remote sales using digital tools. It means we need a new style of face-to-face -face meeting like Silicon Valley ways. And under working from home situation, we understood necessity to prepare new system environment. And also we understood the need to accelerate DX and create a digital driven bank. We are trying to continue to emphasize the importance of DX to our bank customers and the region. And we will contribute to the development of the region and the development of our company with Silicon Valley thinking. What I learned from Stanford is the importance of, of innovation thinking. I think I can finally understand it now and also, I got much personal relationships I have built in Silicon Valley. It's a great asset for my life. I'd like to bring all of them back to Japan, and I will build a new type of thinking bank for the new era. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Dasha, for your advice and encourage. Thank you, Tadada-san, and also thank you for being so concise and succinct. This is exciting. It's good to see. Our next presentation will be by Ms. Aki Takahashi, who is the CEO of also Takahashi Sakai Driving Group. Aki-san, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I am Aki Takahashi 
I would like to talk about my past research and my challenge to move the next step. This is the company overview. I have a foreign company called Sangwa Group. We provide driving lessons for beginner drivers and company drivers. We have daycare and retirement home for local people in Japan. And I have established a new company to develop a new business in Silicon Valley in 2017. In this presentation, I will focus on driving schools and the driving education department for company drivers. This is my introduction. I am currently the CEO at Musashi Sakai Driving School in Japan and Brilliant Hope in Silicon Valley. I was a visiting scholar at Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University between 2015 to 2017. I also was a visiting scholar at U.S. Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford University from 2019 to 2021. This May, I was interviewed by Nikkei Top Leader, a business magazine in Japan. The title is, Will You Close Your Company in 2025? Interview female CEO who established a new company in the U.S. I talked about what I studied at Stanford University and Silicon Valley, and what I am thinking now about our company's future. This is my past research. I was interested in design thinking, especially how to make innovative culture use design thinking because Japanese companies are pursuing more innovation, but we don't know how to do it. Therefore, I focused on the design thinking process. At the same time, I learned when we want to make innovation, we have to change company's culture. So I try to implement the design thinking process with our Japanese employees to develop innovative culture in our company. Design thinking suggests five steps to provide to develop new ideas. First is emphasize. We must understand customers' needs. Second is define. We found the core problems. Third is ideate. We gather ideas to solve problems. Fourth is prototype. We make a prototype. Fifth is we try to test prototype and receive feedback from prototype users. This year, Dr. Dasha gave a presentation for our company's board members. And now we, I am trying out projects with our employees using design thinking. But I think we must spend three to five years to gain good results based on my past research. This is my next challenge. What are the possibilities for digital transformation in our company? We gather over 7,000 beginner driver customers and 10,000 senior customers a year. And we have over 200 member companies to provide safely driving seminars. We can gather driving data, emotional data, vision data, footwork data, memory function data, personality data, unconscious, un unconscious behavior data. I think there are four possibilities. First is transforming customer relationships on marketing, bill payment, customer service. Second is improve the content of our service. And third is develop new business. 
business line that gains value from data. Fourth is automate our service, but we don't plan to automate our service. US Asia Technology Management Center Research Corporate focuses on possibility number three, new business identification and evaluation and on successful adoption by our company. If I had not moved to the US, I would have never been aware of digital transformation in our company. Thank you very much. Thank you, Takahashi-san. That Thank was also you. very nice and concise. Uh, we, if, if it's okay with you, we'll try to post your article with Nikkei, or at least put a link up to it on our website. So I think everyone would enjoy seeing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our next presentation is by Mr. Takaki Zach Okazaki of Nippon Life Insurance. Okazaki-san, are you there? Yes, I'm here and I'll, let me share my screen. Great. And I thank you for the introduction and a good afternoon and a good morning, Japan. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to uh, talk about my current activity. Again, uh, I'm Zach Okazaki and uh, I'm the head of uh, US R&D at Nippon Life uh, Innovation Center, uh, which we call Nippon Life Hex. I started here in uh, 2017 and uh, I, I'm one of the first experts when we began operations uh, in Silicon Valley almost five years ago. Uh, today, uh, I'm gonna brief on the status of my activities at US ATMC. And uh, here's a table of content. Uh, I'd like to talk about three topics today. And uh, uh, let me start with an overview of Nippon Life. And since the company was founded in 1889, uh, over 130 years, uh, we've been helping people uh, live their safety lives. As you can see on the right hand side, uh, we are fifth ranked uh, insurance company in the world and the largest one in, uh, in Japan and they're ranked by uh, total assets. And then uh, what is Nippon Life X? Uh, Nippon Life has a, uh, an innovation group inside uh, which we call Nippon Life X. Uh, there are four locations uh, in this network around the world. And uh, uh, what is unique is that uh, our office uh, in Silicon Valley uh, was opened earlier than the Tokyo office. And that was almost five years ago uh, when uh, is the time the word uh, Insurtech, uh, abbreviation of uh, insurance technology uh, became common. Uh, you can see what our offices do on the right hand side. And uh, our office in Palo Alto uh, has been involved in all three areas, uh, research, uh, investment and the POCs and business development. And now for the next topic, and uh, this is a uh, summary of our history in Silicon Valley. Uh, we started with research and networking uh, to capture what's going on uh, in Silicon Valley. And uh, honestly, uh, when I started here, uh, we didn't know, uh, we didn't have any clear goals and objectives. So uh, I had to figure out what to do uh, by myself through research activities. Uh, in the third year, uh, 2018, uh, following the Silicon Valley ecosystem, uh, we decided to start investment and POCs actively. And we joined the uh, US ATMC in two years ago. And uh, we also set up a new office and a uh, strategic investment fund as well at that time. And uh, my research at US ATMC uh, helped, helped me uh, drive our uh, innovation activities, uh, which I'd like to touch on later. And the flow, uh, last year, uh, our activities have been gradually uh, producing results that affects the uh, uh, businesses of the headquarters. And uh, as a uh, spe specific example, uh, we've started to utilize the solutions of Silicon Valley startups in Japan uh, last year. And uh, this is just for your reference and uh, our results have been uh, appearing in the media uh, since last year. And from here, uh, I'd like to share with you uh, the overview of my research uh, activity at USA TMC. And the uh, uh, first one is about uh, academic study of innovation management. Uh, why does Nippon uh, need the study? And uh, the answer is on the left-hand side. And uh, this is necessary for us because uh, innovation is easy to misunderstand uh, since there's a lot of uh, diversity and the differences inside innovation. 
And for example, uh, for some people, uh, innovation is improving the existing business operations uh, with uh, new technology. And for others, uh, it is something to create a completely new business outside of the uh, insurance business. And the academic study uh, helped me understand multiple cases of innovation and uh, uh, helps better management of innovation with organized framework, uh, like examples on the right hand side. And uh, for us uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, what I learned is that uh, it is very cr critical for us to understand the different, uh, different stakeholders and, uh, and develop portfolio approach to their needs. And also uh, understanding open innovation uh, theory and the culture is also important for us as a uh, fundamental base for innovation. Uh, we are a new organization, uh, so we need to keep progressing, and, but we also have to deal with uh, resource constraint. So the study and the practice of open innovation let us know how we can work efficient, eff effectively and uh, within a constraints by uh, working with our uh, outside of uh, Nippon Life uh, Network. And the uh, uh, last part is about uh, application of knowledge to innovation adoption, uh, especially in Japan. Uh, there are so many differences between the com companies in Silicon Valley and the large corporations in Japan. So uh, this is something uh, that is often uh, pointed out. And uh, in my opinion, one of the solutions for us to reconcile the differences between the countries is learning by doing uh, process. I think that most people learn a great deal by doing things and seeing things actually. And uh, in Stanford's network, in addition to being able to learn from the real world uh, examples, uh, there's an environment uh, where I can uh, test the, the process by uh, talking to startups. So uh, by sharing this process with uh, our members in Japan, uh, we can turn the knowledge into uh, practice. And in closing, uh, I'd like to say thank you to the center and uh, Dr. Dasha and the old visiting scholars. Uh, time at Stanford really helps me to have uh, organized framework to understand innovation and uh, do uh, my own activities. Uh, though my uh, two year term is as a visiting scholar will end soon, but I'd like to uh, continue my relationship with the center and all visiting scholars. And I uh, thank you very much. That is from me. Thank you, Okazaki-san, and uh, thank you for a great, concise presentation. Uh, and I will make a commitment that you're always part of the family. So we have always part of our community. Uh, it's been great to work with you these two years. Our thank next presentation much. is by Mr. Yoshio Nose of the company Nose Kozai. Nose-san, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. This is the first time for me to give a presentation like this. So I'm looking forward to today's meeting. Okay. okay. And uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is uh, Yoshio Nose. I am a visiting scholar at the USATMC Stanford, and I currently work in four companies in Japan and the US as a board member. Of course, each business is very interesting for me. I work with my colleagues to develop each company step by step and day by day. So my work brings my much satisfaction and joy. I'm currently focusing on NCA, uh, Nose Corporation of America and uh, Nose Kozai because uh, NCA was established in the US last November by Nose Kozai. And uh, Nose Kozai made it possible for me to come to Stanford. The next, uh, Nose Kozai is a manufacturing company. So, and I have been working for this company over for more than 15 years. The main focus of this business is the sales of stainless steel materials and the manufacturing of aircraft parts. We provide about 20,000 kinds, 200,000 pieces of customized products every month with quick delivery. It means that most 
two order are received in the morning and the products are delivered that afternoon or the next day. Uh, we have over 3,000 customers. Most of them are manufacturing SME, small and medium sized enterprise, we say chusho kigyo in Japanese. So Nose Kozai has a close relationship with the manufacturing industry in Japan. So currently we are aiming to sell aircraft parts in the US through NCA because this country has the biggest aircraft market in the world. It is 10 times more than Japan. We are also exporting American industrial products to Japan. Specifically, the, uh, these include aircraft materials and uh, parts. Okay, and uh, parts of machines used for cutting steel. Okay, and uh, you can see from my personal background that I'm interested in Japanese SME. I'm interested specifically in corporate direction and management strategy. In recent years, there have been more and more examples of overseas expansion among Japanese SME. Most of them are in the Southeast Asian region and China. And I have the impression that some of my customers are expanding into Vietnam. So, in this context, uh, in this situation, I am interested in researching the advantage of expanding to Silicon Valley and the US and looking at the possibilities of overseas expansion that can contribute to the success of our company. I want to see for myself the situation of the manufacturing industry in the US and what is going on in the Silicon Valley. So I joined the USATMC to research these questions. So with uh, this interest in mind, uh, I am a visiting scholar at Stanford and I'd like to share some of the activities I've been doing in my research. I'm focusing on long and short-term business as SME with limited resource in terms of people, uh, goods, and money. I'm aiming to expand my current business. I'm also researching the possibility of sowing seeds for future business in the US. Each theme is almost divided into tech and market. I researched SME in the Silicon Valley and the airplane market in the US. Uh, tech topics are material and digital manufacturing and so on. So 3D printing is interesting because this technology can change the manufacturing value chain. Okay, this is a final slide. I have shared these activities with our employees in Japan because I want to speed up the process and uh, they want to know about the Silicon Valley and the US situation. Since some activity topics are important to the current actual business, we have been working on the project with domestic members at the same time. Uh, regarding the topic of 3D printing, Nose Kozai started a satellite parts project with Japanese university this year. DX, uh, digital transformation is an important topic for each company. We have started collaborating on research with Shigari University and the Teikok Data Bank this year. Uh, it means that my research is not only by myself, my colleagues also enjoy doing it in Japan. I'm excited about this project and uh, I'm looking forward to our collaboration. Uh, that's it. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nose-san. That was great. Very concise, very informative. 
Our next presentation will be by Mr. Keishun Nakamura of Mitsubishi Research Institute. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Keishun Nakamura from Tokyo. Um, it's about 10, 10.30 in the morning here. I have conducted research uh, with Dasha Sensei um, from Tokyo for about nine months with full remote environment. And I'm planning on going to Stanford when the visiting scatter restriction removed. Um, anyway, um, as I'm a member of Mississippi Research Institute, so let me introdu introduce our company profile at first. After that, I'm going to explain about my research as a visiting scholar. Um, this slide shows our company profile. Uh, this slide is quite busy, sorry, but I will give an outline briefly. Mitsubishi Research Institute was founded in uh, 1970. Head office is in Tokyo and branches are in Osaka and Nagoya. Recently, we have opened uh, overseas branches, which are in Vietnam and United Arab Emirates. And our value chain is to provide a total package services from research and recommendation to implementation. And our business segment can be divided into two groups, IT services and think tank services. And think tank services, uh, traditional workforce, and more than half of net sales of think tank service comes from government and public sector. And then uh, one of our strongest points is that our company uh, consists of members uh, who specialize in various fields. We have 836 uh, researchers whose expertise are not only natural science, but also social science. Okay, um, next slide is uh, just a relaxing slide. Just a little bit, I, I like to share as a view from our office. This is a photo I took four years ago at head office. You can see as a national diet building at the center of the photo. I said that we often work with government and the public sector. The location is also good to work with them. But recently, uh, under the uh, emergency declaration in Tokyo, uh, most workers of our company are working from home. So we had received this view now. Okay. At this slide, I will explain my research target as a visiting scholar. As a researcher in Mitsubishi Research Institute, I have conducted research and development support for nuclear industry, and especially uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant decommissioning. Uh, through my work, I have become aware of issues and that nuclear industry is difficult to make innovation. I assume that three, no, nah, sorry, I assume that there are three bottlenecks uh, there here. Um, nuclear industry is relatively difficult for technological collaboration uh, with other fields and is isolated uh, even in energy industries. And then uh, long-term uh, research and development uh, and tough regulatory negotiation are also needed. I assume um, that uh, there are many industries that are facing similar problems. And so therefore my research as a visiting scholar isn't limited to nuclear power, but target various uh, industries in the US. So I have shifted research focus on uh, three themes below, a clean tech accelerator program, a role of mentor in startup ecosystem, a market evolution of autonomous taxi service. I will explain it of each from next slide. Now the first theme is accelerator program of utility as an example of collaboration with other fields. Um, utilities and clean tech startup each have a challenge that is best met by cooperating with, is, with each other. Existing utilities need to seek new value and competitiveness. On the other hand, clean tech startup is getting to market because energy market is, uh, are very complex and strictly regulated. So many accelerator programs in existing utilities have launched recently. I'm now measuring the impact of accelerator programs by utilities by analyzing the performance of startups uh, which participated in the program. And the second, uh, the second theme is role of mentor in startup ecosystem as an example of outside support. The technological startups uh, need outside supporters for business. Supporters are divided into two groups, a strong engagement supporter like mentor and weak engagement supporter like consultant. I focus on mentor who makes long-term relationship with founders and help founders become aware of what they haven't thought. And then as a result, some, uh, as a result of some interviews, the benefit for startups um, by using mentor seem to be more recognized in the US than in Japan. And now I'm investigating the relationship of complementary expertise between founders and mentors to startup growth and how founders make network and meet with mentors under COVID-19 pandemic. 
And the last thing is market evolution of autonomous taxi service. As an example of industry needed for long-term uh, R&D and strict government regulation, um, my research focuses on market evolution of Waymo as a leading company that is now providing an autonomous taxi service in Arizona. Uh, through investigation, I confirmed that a major new paradigm requires simultaneous evolution of a new behavior among regulators, individuals, technology providers, and systems providers. Now I'm trying to understand of development of a framework of uh, market deployment by investigating regulation cost, business model in early stage of Waymo, and their preparation for pivot in detail. Okay, that's all uh, as a research contents. Um, I'm looking forward to going to Stanford when visiting Scala restriction removed. I really hope to experience this community of Stanford and Silicon Valley. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nakamura-san. And we hope that the restriction is limited soon yeah. too. We would love to see you here as soon as you can get here. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, we haven't heard anything from Stanford yet, but um, we will make that happen somehow. Anyway, uh, we have our final presentation today, which is going to be by uh, Mr. Yasuhito Ando with Kozo Keikaku Engineering, KKE. Ando-san, are you there? Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Yasuhito Ando. Uh, I'm from Kozo Keikaku Engineering, Inc. Today, I'm going to talk about this year's my results. Uh, our company was uh, founded in 1959 as a university uh, launched venture firm. It is important that we are an independent company with no capital from large corporations. Uh, we have expanding our business domain about every 20 years. Initially, we were just a structural design firm for buildings. Then uh, we analyzed natural phenomena such as earthquakes, wind, and tsunamis. And now we analyze human behavior and uh, social phenomena. The common denominator is that we use simulation technology to solve a social issue. Uh, let me introduce myself a little. My major is uh, architecture. Uh, at KKE, I have uh, worked with, uh, for over 20 years. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have been a visiting scholar at Stanford since uh, 2018. Uh, this year, I'm studying corporate innovation strategies and human resource development methods through my research on open innovation and design thinking. These are the other activities. Uh, at the, the Japan Society's event, 10th anniversary, the Great East Japan earthquake, KKE presented as a representative uh, of Japanese disaster prevention companies. I was also involved in uh, uh, research collaboration with the University of Tokyo uh, from Silicon Valley. I thought about the innovation strategy of companies. As you know, today's uncertain future is called VUCA. In such a society, flexibility is necessary. It is the same for many Japanese companies that have a long tradition and like to grow steadily. Here, what is important is to clarify the vision of the company without being confused by the trends of the world. This is an effective way to build a corporate brand and uh, motivate employees. This vision is not about short-term growth or securing profit. It is about what our companies exist for, exist for. It is not easy to set a vision for an uncertain future, but 
by setting if then. We can set our vision with that flexibility. Now, here are two points that I think are effective as an uh, innovation strategy. The first is to create a team that promotes innovation and uh, to establish a chief strategy officer. Many Japanese companies have a strong focus on quality. This is important, but it can be an uh, obstacle when it comes to innovation. We need a team that can uh, practice agile in a way that is separate from the existing business. Also, executives are usually too busy with their businesses. We need a special person who can keep abreast of social trends and uh, uh, constantly think about the future of the company. Second, of course, that is people. I learned that I need more opportunity to practice. Based on these learnings, I'm considering the following plan for my company. After all, in order to become an innovative company, we need a long-term and a continuous strategy. This is the establishment of KKE Labo. In Silicon Valley, there is the famous M Labo, but KKE is neither a trading company nor a venture capital firm. So uh, our purpose is a little different. The key is long-term investment uh, discretion and management consensus. What is the purpose of KKE Labo? It is to agreement, uh, aggregate a value within our company and uh, become the core of, of a wave of change. I want to create a place where people who share the same soci social issues can come together, both inside and outside the company. Uh, my goal is uh, to transform the, the entire company into a uh, innovation organization by using this kind of place. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ando-san. And thanks very much to all of our visiting scholars. Ando-san, that was great. It was concise. In fact, everybody really stayed on time and gave a lot of information. I do want to tell everyone that we will post the slides so that you can see them on our website and see all of the information that our uh, visiting scholars only had time to uh, summarize. So this is the beginning of the next year. And we're very excited to move forward from here. Uh, that was the slide I was giving that got cut off. My point is that we're going to keep doing what we're doing that works, and we're going to try to keep adding new things that will also bring value. Uh, we're looking forward a great deal to working with all of our community, both inside Stanford and also in our member companies and also in the communities in Silicon Valley and all over Japan and Asia. So I want to thank you very much for your presentations. Please join me in saying thanks to our visiting scholars.